That's something I can find out tomorrow when I'm at the distillery. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah you're going on a pick tomorrow. That's right. What, That's what, right. What, what are you hoping to, to come up with tomorrow? A good time. You know, just I, I really just like um, I like being around Eddie. So you, Eddie's taking you on the pick. I hope so. I say, hey, but if not, you know, if I'm going with Bruce, that's great. Welcome to another trip down the Bourbon Road with your hosts, Jim and Randy. So grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back. I'd like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Find out more about their fine rustic furniture at logheadshomecenter.com. So, Jim, David Jennings, rarebird101.com. What do you think? What a great guy. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. And knowledgeable, man. What he knows about wild turkey. And when he shows up somewhere, he brings some bottles, let me tell you. Oh, man. I, you know, I got turned on to some things that I had, I knew nothing about, let's just say. So now you know all the, the real terms like cheesy gold foil and split label. And dusty. And, and dusty. You know, and, all the dusty was good. So you've had some great turkeys today, yes, haven't you? Yes, I have. Well, it was really good to have David on the show today. What a what a humble guy. What a what a guy that's committed to his cause, and he's got a lot of things going on. Things are going good for him right now. Yeah, and I look forward to this book. This, yeah. this book ought to be awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. I think we can expect great things out of David, and already, you know, with his blog and what he's got going on, rarebird101.com, a lot of good things going on there. Well, well he's, you know, he's sending his... His draft of Fred Minnick, so it can't be too bad, you know. I guess not. I guess <laughs> not. Well, I tell you what, Randy, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, sign off here, and let's listen to David and uh, and talk a little bit of turkey. Sounds good. All right, bye. I'm pretty excited today. We're here in, uh, in Lexington, Kentucky at Base 110. We've got a pretty exciting guest with us. Yeah, Dave Jennings, Rare Bird 101. we got to find out how he came up with this Rare Bird name. I kind of have an <laughs> idea, but we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> David, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. So we're going to get right into our first pour today. Okay. And what we brought for you is a Russell's Reserve pick. This is actually a pick that I was on with uh, the Lexington Bourbon Society and a whiskey, and the Whiskey Bear, which is a, which is a nice bar here in Lexington. And uh, we did this pick um, in the dead of winter. It was cold. Let me tell you, it was cold. But let's go ahead and uh, take a nose. And, sure. And uh, cheers. Cheers. I get a little butterscotch on that. Yes, me too. Well, there, to me, right off the bat, there's a um, a nice kind of Fruity, what I call like fruity vanilla spice, where you have that that vanilla back backbone, but then there's kind of like this uh, fruity uh, thing that kind of sits there right above it, and I get that in, in a lot of the Tyrone stuff. Um, but What's, this is what K. spice? What spice do you think? Well, like when I say vanilla spice, I think like a vanilla spice candle. Okay, so you're gonna kind of have uh, where there's like not quite herbal. But there's like some cinnamon or some nutmeg, uh, and uh, you know you'll have like a, maybe a little bit of brown sugar in there or something. Um, so right off the bat, it's that vanilla spice, but there's some fruit there too. Right. Um, some like red fruit. Um, yeah, I do. I do get some fruit on it, but you know, I was like, like, I was, like maybe plum or apple uh, peel. I'm, yeah. it's more like a red apple. Red peel. apple. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, I get I get just a little bit of. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say pina colada, coconut maybe. Just just a hint of it. You know what's strange is that I've actually heard more than one person tell me that they get coconut on some Russell's picks. Um, personally, that's never happened for me. But I could maybe see like a, if you had like a uh, like a coconut pie or something where you have the vanilla cream, you know, and the pastry, and then some coconut there too. To me, I could I could pull that yeah. out of it. It just has this kind of a tropical, a little bit of a tropical, a little bit of a tropicalness. Mm -hmm. so not, but it's very faint. It's very faint. Yeah. So when we it's great picked, on the nose. When we picked this one, it was literally twenty degrees outside. Yeah, that's hard. So, to, hard to do. Yeah, and you know it, we're in a warehouse with Eddie, and it's probably 
five degrees cooler than that in the warehouse. Did you try to warm it up with your hands and <laughs> everything all that? we could do? Yeah, yeah. But it was really hard. Yeah. Well, let's take a let's take a drink of this. Yeah, it's a good pick. Yeah, it's good. A little bit of clove. Yes. There's the clove and the cinnamon for sure for me. Hot spice was what I you know, that clove always comes across mm-hmm. a little bit. A little bit warm. Herbal spice for sure. Mm-hmm. But I do get a little bit of that fruit on the mid palate. Mm-hmm. You know, K, Rickhouse K, traditionally, if I if if you were to go to my site and maybe look at some of the reviews, K tends to have that red fruit spice kind of thing going on. Yeah. Um, there's always a lot of, uh, and it depends on the floor too. Like I've had some lower uh, uh, floor picks from K and it, it, I've even had one or two that almost kind of had like a strawberry kind of thing. Oh, really? where It's like a real bright fruit and some citrus, but then you get to the upper floors and it, it totally changes in dynamic and, and you get a lot deeper, richer, uh, darker, you know, fruit than you would have on the lower floor. Um, K is kind of a, um, a, a wild card in a way. Cause like you get like, if you have had a lot of picks from like Rickhouse B or D, um, they kind of have like a lot of similarities um, with each other. K, it's like you never really know what you're going to get. You'll get, you know, one and you'll think, oh, this is going to be, you know, H or something. And it's not. And it goes from real bright and it can go to real dark. It just depends. Uh, matter of fact, I have a, uh, a single cast nation barrel selection out there from Rickhouse K that's over 10 years old. Cask strength, uh, non-chill filtered, um, and it actually did a, an additional year of aging in Bardstown at their warehouse, warehouse in, oh. in Bardstown. So it's a very unique pour. So I hope you guys have yeah. some of that. Yeah, I'd like to try it. It's yeah. from K, and it is amazing. I mean, it's stellar. I think you're really gonna. You don't really get single barrels from Wild Turkey at Cask Strength, um, right. and, and Single Cast Nation is about the only place you're going to get that unless you go to the distillery. Yeah, and a lot taste. of times the, the barrels are, you know, they're kind of borderline if they're going to come out, you know, strong enough to be at Russell's pick. Yeah, sometimes they, they're they going to have to be a Wild Turkey, Kentucky Spirit. Um, uh, but, you know, with Wild Turkey, they use a, a rather low entry proof. So you do get a lot of Russell's picks that border around the 110 mark. So I've seen plenty that are 111, 112, 110 point something. Right. Um, very little water added. Very little water added. Right. Um, and I did, there was a, a rumor going around for a while because there's an ATF ruling that says, you know, within two points, you can call something barrel proof. Okay. And there was a rumor going around that if it was within two points of 110, while Turkey didn't add any water. And so people were marketing their Russell's picks as cast strength. Oh, really? So I asked Eddie about it, and I said, "Is there? Is that true? Y'all don't?" He's like, "We always add water. We always add. We, it's it'll come out to one ten, you know, if, if necessary. So unless your pick is one ten point zero on the dot at time of bottling, it's going to have whatever water is necessary. And if it's one hundred nine point nine, it's well, got to be a spirit. It's going to have to go to Kentucky Spirit, yeah. right? Right. And this this is a one ten, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 All Russells are one ten. Gotcha. Well, all Russell single barrels. Um, for the bourbon. Now, the rise is not 110. The rise 104. But Well, that's good. That's an enjoyable that's an enjoyable drink. Yeah, it's a great pick. Um, good way to kick off my night. There you go. Awesome. Well, let me ask you, um, what does the bourbon culture mean to you? Well, to me, the bourbon culture is very online. It's very... Because I live in South Carolina. I don't live in Kentucky. And... There's no bourbon clubs in my immediate area, um, at least none that ever come to my attention. So all of my interaction in the bourbon scene takes place uh, via social media, um, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Reddit. Um, I have a Patreon account, and I'm very close to those folks. Um, So the bourbon community to me is a very large group. Uh, in, in the sense of it, it comes from a very large area from around the world and then narrows down in to where the focus is strictly the spirit, okay? And so politics are put aside, religion is put aside, and we come together in celebration of, of, of a drink, um, a uniquely American drink. And uh, I think that we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of folks in the industry, I say in the industry, in the hobby, 
a lot of folks not be now taking advantage of that. Yeah. So there there are some some groups that you know are turning this into a money making opportunity. But for the most, I've seen nothing but kindness, good heartedness, willingness to share, uh, fellowship. Um, it's been a uh, it's been a real fun hobby to be involved in over the last couple of years. It I, really has. I would I would agree with that. My my palate is not as you know as as. I don't know how, how would how would developed. I say it's developed? Yes, yeah, as as your your guys and and what's neat is someone like yourself and and Jim, you guys kind of gurus to me. Well, and you t- kind of say it now, Randy. Here's you know, da da da. I wouldn't and, think and of gets, it that way. I, to me, everybody like they'll say that, and I'll say, well, I, I'm not an expert. You just kind of like what you like. Some people have a way of describing a drink in a different way than than another person. You hear a lot of people say especially when they're first starting out, oh, that's smooth, that's smooth, you know, or that's sweet. And that's just because they just haven't been involved in it long enough to start picking out the little fine, you know, things. But it'll come, it'll come. And and, and anyone out there that tries to make themselves out to be some super taster or super guru, give them a blind, you know, and we'll see. Because yeah. that, I mean... Anybody can be fooled on a blind, anybody, unless you've had the amount of experience like someone like Jimmy Russell. I mean, a lot of these master distillers, true master distillers, they can pick out new make. You know, they can taste new make and go, that's Maker's Mark, you know, that's Jim Beam. When you can do that, you're you're a bona fide That's pretty impressive. Well, I, I, heard a, I heard a story about Mr. Jimmy. Okay. And uh, a woman had brought him some candy uh-huh. that she had made. And she goes, tell me what I used in this. And he took a bite of the candy. He goes, hmm. I think that's about Jim Beam about four years. And that one's been aged about four years, Jim. She goes, how did you know that? You know, so yeah. Jimmy's one of the best, I guess you, you could say. You, you're not kidding. I've heard the same <laughs> story. I think it was honey that someone gave him. And, and he knew what area the honey came from. I don't oh, know. Honey, some, really? Wow. See, it was, I cannot remember what it was, but it was some other, it was a non-bourbon item food item and he knew from tasting you know what it was made from or or where it came from or whatever and i was like you gotta be kidding me really (laughs) and uh so you know there's years of experience and it it makes a difference you know it really does um but like i said if you can taste new make and say where it came from then you know what you're doing and Um, it's it's a developmental kind of thing i mean you you, your palate builds over time i guess your your library of tastes and odors Mm -hmm. build over time right yeah and so and we've talked about it before sometimes you can uh you can have just the wrong thing for lunch and it just blows everything Mm -hmm. out of the water so yeah yeah it'll mess it up but we appreciate uh the bourbon community taking those of us whose palates are not quite as developed and saying hey it's okay but just yours doing is just as valid as anyone else's. I, I, I truly believe that. I, I can take anyone off the street and I can sit them down and expose them to spirits and just say, look, do you like it or not? Now, they may not be a, a, a bourbon person or whatever, and then you're probably grabbing the wrong person. But if they say they like bourbon, they like like, like whiskey, um, just because they can't describe it a certain way or know where it came from doesn't mean that they're opinion isn't as valid. Right. You know? Right. So. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned you're from South Carolina. Mm-hmm. What part of South Carolina are you from? Uh, I'm, I live in North Augusta, which is across the river from Augusta, from Augusta Georgia. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's that master's. Uh, kind is that, of born, is yeah. that born and raised? Yeah. 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 Wow. My, my family is from, uh, well, uh, the McCormick area, which is, uh, you know, it's in that general area, but it's, it's about, you know, half hour or so oh. away from where I live. Savannah River, right? That right. Run, the runs Savannah between, River. between yeah, the two of them. Right. Yeah, I have I have actually two down the Savannah River. Yeah, of course we weren't drinking bourbon then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I trace my my ancestors on my, my my dad's side all the way back to the pretty much the boat. So, really? Uh, yeah. Wow! Wow! So, That's been, great. Been so, in, so are, are you a genealogist? Do you do you do no, that kind of stuff, or I, just just interested? I was interested for. I mean, I am still interested, but I, I went on a little spurt where I kind of traced my family history back um, to the the. 1700s on my Jennings side. Wow. Um, and I'm and I'm in the um, well, I'm, I'm in the Sons of the American Revolution because I had uh, an ancestor that fought in the Revolutionary War, and then I've got a good many in the Civil War, um, and uh, so it, it's just a, it was really interesting to learn these things. The South, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, they were all uh, Confederate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, but that's that's just the way it was back then. You know, yeah. everybody, uh, you know, you fought for the home team. So right. you know, yeah. if you live up north, you're in town is signing yeah. up. Yeah, so yeah. that's what yeah. I'm going to do. So, how did you first get into bourbon? Um, 
Well, I've always enjoyed enjoyed like whiskey and, and, and Coke. I say always, but like when I went to college, um, Jack and Coke was a big drink or Crown and Coke was a, and that would tend to be what I would have. And this was in the early to mid nineties. Okay. okay? Um, and so if I'd got to eat with my wife or whatever, later on years later, I would just get Jim and Coke, Jack and Coke, Crown and Coke, something like that. Uh, around 2013 or so, uh, I was at my brother-in-law's house. Uh, he had this fancy crown Royal special edition thing in a box, you know, and, uh, he asked me if I wanted some and I said, sure. I was thinking it was going to be like in a mixed drink and he gave it to me on the rocks. And that was the first I'd ever really sipped whiskey, you know, like on the rocks or something. And it was a lot better than I thought it would be. I was like, this is really nice, you know, and it got my brain like really churning. I'm like, I'm going to get me one of these, you know? <laughs> and I went to the liquor store and I was like blown away, but it was just like rows and rows of boxes and, you know, tubes and bottles. And you're like, what do I do? You know? So I'm like, well, I'm going to find the best one, you know? So I started off like with Crown Royal and then I moved on to like Scotch and then I started getting Irish and then I would just get anything I could get my hands on trying to find the best thing. And I got into bourbons and one day I was uh, looking at the bourbons and on my checkout, I, I asked for a pint of Wild Turkey 101. I was thinking it was going to be like the low shelf poor man's drink or something. Well, like was that. that your first bourbon that you tried? Actual bourbon? No, the first bourbon I sipped, first bourbon I sipped neat. That's tough. It probably would have been something like, I think it was Buffalo Trace. I think it was just oh, really? plain Buffalo, Buffalo Trace, Trace yeah. uh, 90 proof. Um, I'm pretty sure it was either that or Evan Williams Single Barrel. It might have been Evan Williams Single Barrel. I bought them on the same day. I remember that. Both home good with pours. Both of them, so. um, but uh, I asked for Wild Turkey 101 at checkout at some point, and I wasn't expecting a lot out of it because when I was in college, that was what you would do as shooters. You know, it was like the, the Wild Turkey was like kind of the, the party boy, you know, uh, uh, frat boy or, you know, party rock star kind of thing. And uh, anyway, um, I had it neat, and I was like, this is really good. Like, what is all this talk about being like the bottom shelf whiskey, you know? And uh, I'm like, this is just crazy. So I bought some more, and I was drinking it a good bit. Like, I was like choosing it over other things that were a lot more sought after. And uh, like, I had like spent a lot of money on like Willet Pot still, and Wild Turkey 101 was better to me, you know? So, uh, Anyway, I was on Reddit, and I was talking about uh, how much I thought that Wild Turkey 101 was underappreciated. And a guy messaged me, and this is back before the rules changed in Reddit uh, on our bourbon, and he said, hey, man, have you ever had Dusty Wild Turkey? And I was, no, I've never had that. He's like, I'll send you something. And he sent me a cheesy gold full from 92 and a 81, 101 eight year. And I wasn't expecting a lot out of them. And when I poured the 1018 year and nosed it for the first time, it, I mean, I, I literally like sat back. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, and I was like, this is incredible. And I, you know, just kept going back to it. And I'm like, I've got to get this, you know. And then I realized that like, this is not something that you can just go find, you know. Right. Um, and, but it got me started. You know, it's right. like, well, I've got to, you know, surely there's some kind of, you know, Russell's Reserve or something that tastes like this, you know. So I started buying up all the different wild turkey catalog, and I started learning about uh, Lawrenceburg area. I started learning about the Russell family, um, and I just felt this connection to uh, the brand uh, just as much, if not more, than the whiskey itself. It was like it just it just was the package deal for me. It was like I felt like it was genuine. I felt like it was the underdog. I felt like uh, I was getting a product that someone put a, a lot of time into. And, and I'm not talking about like when they made that bottle. I'm talking about a lot of time that was put into it going back decades. Like yeah. I felt like I was getting a piece of history with every bottle. Um, even if, if it was a modern release, I felt like there was just something here that you don't find, I mean, how many other distilleries can you think of with multi-generation master distillers? And uh, if you if you watch interviews with the Russells, I mean, it just really pulls you in. And I stopped buying a lot of things and started buying a lot of turkey instead. And I found myself writing a lot of reviews um, on Reddit primarily. And one day I was like, yeah, I've got like about 
20 something wild turkey reviews, I ought to just put them on a blog. And so I put them all on one blog and I had it private for months. I didn't, and, that, and that's how Rare Bird 101 that's started. That's how Rare Bird 101 started. Oh, okay. I, I, I just took a lot of reviews I had written, started a blog, and then I made it public. And just slowly but surely, you know, I'd start getting more viewers every other day or so. And um, it just grew from there. So and there's a lot of uh, wild turkey uh, fans out there. I guess. Yeah, it was it was surprising. It, it, it was a lot more folks than I realized. Um, and and the, the the cool thing about wild turkey is, is that your the fan base is so diverse. Um, I, I've I've talked to people from all walks of life, from all different areas, from different countries, and they all just love wild turkey passionately. And it's not like this one little niche group. It's a a small group made of a, a large group of people. Um, very diverse group of people. So, so um, one of the questions we usually ask all of our guests is, "What is your daily drinker?" Well, if you if you want to look like statistically, like you know, if you went back and looked every day at what I drink, it's yeah, going to be Russell. We want the numbers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Russell's Reserve Single Barrel is going to be the one, probably. Okay. okay? Um, but uh, if you want to ask me, like, in general, what's what's the best daily drinker? I normally would say Wild Turkey 101. Um, Rare Breed Batch 116.8, which is the latest batch, is kind of a contender there now for me. Because even though it's more expensive, it's barrel proof. And so I find that, you know, it's it's hard to, to say which one has the better value. Because Wild Turkey 101 is everywhere. You go to any restaurant, it's there. You go to any liquor store, it's there. You can get it in minis. You can get it in half pints, pints, fists, liters, handles. So Wild Turkey 101 is hard to beat. It really is. But then Rare Breed, you're going to get that Wild Turkey 101 profile at a barrel proof. So, you know, for like $40, $45. So that is, there's an incredible value there as a daily drinker as well if you like more of a, a stronger, you know, proof spirit. Okay. So really between the two, kind of Russell's is your kind of go-to and then Wild Turkey 101 is just your everyday. Right. And if yeah. you want something stronger, go for Rare Breed. But right. I, between those three is where you're going to find me every day. So what much. about what about Kentucky Spirit? Because I know Kentucky Spirit's kind of, and I, I don't want to say this the wrong way, Kentucky Spirit just doesn't it, have Jim. the market. Well, they don't it. have the market share yeah. that the other the other labels have for Wild Turkey. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not as... Uh, Appreciate it, I guess. No, it's not. And and so, what do you think about Wild Spirit? Um, okay. Kentucky Spirit. I'm sorry. I, I think that you have to realize that the Kentucky Spirit that is bottled now is not the Kentucky Spirit that a lot of people, you know, came up with. Um, when Kentucky Spirit started in the '90s, okay, it was first bottled in '94. I think it actually premiered in '95, but you're going to see a '94 date on the on the rim. Uh, you got to remember that Wild Turkey's entry proof was different back then. It was 107. So, you know, you're getting a very close to barrel proof by the time that maturation sets in. Um, as the entry proof changed, Kentucky Spirit changed. So you're going to have more water added to it. It's going to be diluted a little more. And then I'm thinking, and I don't know for a certainty, but it could be that the barrels that were chosen, you know, for Kentucky Spirit before Russell's Reserve was even on the picture, um, they're going to be a little bit more mature, I would think, because you're not competing with Russell's Reserve single barrel. So if you have some a single barrel that's worthy of a single barrel bottle, it's going to go to Kentucky Spirit by default. So when Russell's Reserve single barrel was introduced, that was like 2013. Okay, that's now competing with the same stocks that Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit was. So you know you're going to find the choice barrels that are 110 or greater going to Russell's Reserve single barrel. And then whatever's after that's going to go to Kentucky now, Spirit. Now, so, Spirit, Kentucky Spirit has some 12-year barrels, right? Well, I have a 13-year uh, a Kentucky Spirit from Moonshine Grill. That is a very rare thing. Uh, okay. Wild Turkey does not let well-aged barrels like that go very easily. Uh, Moonshine Grill has a relationship with the Russells that some other places do not. And so they were able to get a few special bottles. Like they have a 12-year Russells Reserve, and then they had a 13-year Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit recently. So I was lucky enough to be able to get those. Um, so they exist. They're just yeah. not something you're going to find. And there's a group in South Carolina, I believe, that that was able to get a 12-year Kentucky Spirit. Um, and I've heard, I, th I think I've heard Bruce say that uh, that if you are a fan of the old uh, 101.8, that Kentucky Spirit is about as close as you're going to get with today's stocks. It's not going to taste like dusty 101.8. It's just not. Here, the, the, the analogy I always give people is this. 
imagine you're on a highway and 101, Wild Turkey 101 is that highway. You have two off ramps you can go on. The first off ramp is for someone wanting a bold, rich, heavier profile with a, a heavier proof, and that's gonna be Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. The other off ramp is gonna be someone that wants something that's gonna stay on the 101 proof, that's gonna have a little bit more finesse to it. It'll be like 101 but with, with a finesse to it, with a little bit more layers, that's Kentucky Spirit. So you have this 101 and then you have the two off ramps and you can go this way, you can go that way. It just depends on what you're looking for in a single barrel. And how do you feel about the Kentucky Spirit now that they've had a bottle change? Well, I wasn't a fan of the redesign. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's not something that, uh, well, I complained about it. <laughs> if you look back, you know, I complained about it because it's such an iconic uh, bottle. And to lose that to essentially a relabel of rare breed or rare breeds glass, um, it hurt a little bit. I was like, ah, I hate that. Now that it's happened and I have several of those at the house, in the new bottle, I find myself reaching for it a good bit. Um, yeah. I've kind of let that go. I mean, it's just looks because it's what matters is what's in the inside. And some of the newer Kentucky Spirits from Camp Nelson have actually performed very well in my mind, at least on taste. I think that Camp Nelson uh, Rick houses tend to handle the dilution a little bit better than some of the Tyrone ones because when I taste some of the Tyrone Kentucky Spirit uh, bottlings, a lot of times I'm like, man, I just wish this was Russell's Reserve. Like, I just wish I had that little bit more. But I don't really think that direction so much when I'm sipping some of the ones from Camp Nelson. I don't know why that is, but yeah. It, yeah. You know, it just could be maybe the barrels I've gotten lately. But Let's change directions here just okay. a little bit. Um, so last year, uh, summer and fall, we had uh, kind of a revelation of uh, some changes in the juice of 101. Uh, I guess not just the 101, but other things as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, they used some older stocks in 101. Uh, Long Branch had eaten up a lot of the eight-year barrels. And so in order to get them, you've got to remember, they're not really shooting for a certain age. They're shooting for a certain flavor profile, a certain taste. So when, in, when Eddie is tasting the batches, if it tastes like maybe this is a little bit too six-year heavy, he's going to want something above that. So if the eight's not there, you're going to grab the 10. Okay. And so last year, because of Long Branch eating up a lot of the eight-year barrels, they had to go for some 10-year barrels to make 101. And I mean, yes, there's a difference. Um, I thought that a lot of the mid-2018 101 uh, batch bottles that I tried were excellent. Um, I don't think that it's something to go nuts over and go buy a bunch of cases like a lot of people did. Um, yeah. Because 101 is just a consistently good bourbon. And, th and those bottles are still on the shelves. I mean, yeah. you can still find them. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and you know, like I said, it, it's Eddie's going for a flavor. He's, he's going by taste. Um, I think if you get too stuck on these bottle codes, you're going to pigeonhole yourself and you're going to miss out on something potentially better. Do you think it's likely that that's still going on? I mean, with the stocks sure. going to uh, sure. Long Branch. and It's like Bruce told me. I mean, they're, they've always, you know, with batches, you're always putting older barrels in just to get the profile where it needs to be. It's just, it just became a big deal this, this last time how big around. is a batch of 101? Uh, you know, I don't know how many uh, barrels go into a batch of 101. Um, I would imagine it would be, uh, you know, well over 100 uh, is my guess. Um, I, I, that's something I can find out tomorrow when I'm at the distillery. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah you're going on a pick tomorrow. That's right. right. What, that's what, right. What, what are you hoping to, to come up with tomorrow? A good time. You know, just right. I, I okay. really just like um, I like being around Eddie. You know, I've, I've got a chance so to you, hang around Eddie's Eddie. taking you on the pick. I hope so. Yeah. I say, but if not, you know, if I'm going with Bruce, that's great. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just I, I just want the the experience there, the fun. You know, the conversation. Uh, being around these folks that are in the room here beside us, uh, the fellowship, that's all I'm really interested. I'm not trying to find it. You have a lot of people that go in there, they're trying to find the next, you know, hit barrel that, you know, is going to get big money on the secondary or something. I really could care less about that. So, but have you had any of these epic picks? Have you have you had any of those? Can you think of one? I've had a few. I've had, yeah, there's a short barrel from Woodland Wine a couple years ago. It was only like 42 bottles. It was from M. 
I don't remember the barrel number, but it was amazing. And uh, I always talk about that when people always ask this question. Um, the uh, barrels that the Jewish Whiskey Company picks, I've never had a bad one from them. I've had one. There was one they picked from D that was a little bit more modern. Um, and it wasn't a standout as some of the other ones that they picked. But the the 10-year K uh, that's in the room next to us, uh, it's stellar. I mean, it, it's probably one of the best wild turkey well, definitely one of the best modern wild turkey barrels I've ever had. Well, you've got a, a gathering of supporters yeah. here. So so what is this all about? Why, why are you actually here in Lexington? Okay. Um, I have a Patreon uh, account. Uh, it's patreon.com slash rarebird101. And I set it up to basically uh, just as a way for folks to basically get more content. So I have my blog, which is, you know, a post a week. Okay. But Patreon, I tend to post every day or every other day. Um, and there's a lot of different topics I can talk about. Sometimes I just share links. Sometimes I write an article. Sometimes I do a review. Sometimes I, I'll do first pours and I'll do last pours. So when I get close to finishing a bottle, I'll talk about how it finished out. Or when I open a, a first, like a lot of people like it for the first pour because they get to find out my thoughts on something before the review's written. So if I open like, like for example, when Masters Keep Cornerstone comes my way, I'll do a first pour. They're going to get my take on it a couple weeks before the review comes out. Um, and uh, it just kind of started as just a way to uh, provide extra content uh, to folks that, that follow the blog. And it really turned into something special because a lot of people signed up. I mean, I have like 143 patrons now, which blows me away because I was I was, hoping, I was thinking maybe I could get 20 people, <laughs> you yeah. know, and that would be really cool. And it, it grew. And uh, so I try to reward my patrons as best I can, um, uh, not just with objects, but like what we have, you know, uh, beside us is just a gathering where I, um, I'm basically throwing out some really rare bottles and just saying, here, I want you guys to to sip and enjoy these. And, and I want to fellowship and let's talk and let's hang out. Let's get to know each other and talk about wild turkey. And then we'll do a barrel pick the next day. And then those bottles in turn will be, uh, you know, made sure I'll make sure that my patrons are first in line for those right. bottles. Well, that's great. Awesome. Well, I think this is as good a spot as any for us to take a break here. Okay. Allow you to go out and uh, talk to some yeah. of your patrons. And when we come back, uh, we'll uh, we'll see what you brought for us. Great. Sound Sounds good. good. Thank right. you. <laughs> like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of the Bourbon Road. Logheads Home Center, nestled in the hills of Kentucky, is an industry leader in building handcrafted rustic furniture. Family owned and operated, they take pride in offering only the very best for their customers. The Logheads, and that's what they like to call themselves, are skilled woodcrafters who are passionate about creating rustic furniture for people who appreciate the beauty of natural wood. Owners Tommy and Gwen don't just sell the rustic lifestyle, they live it. And you can be sure that Logheads Furniture will always be handcrafted in Kentucky by artisans who embrace the simple way of life. Logheads Rustic Furniture is made from northern white cedar, a sustainable wood that's naturally rot and termite resistant. Its beauty and quality will add warmth to your earthy lifestyle for generations to come. Be sure to check out everything they have to offer at logheadshomecenter.com. And while you're at it, Give Tommy and Gwen a shout on Facebook or Instagram at Logheads Home Center. Okay, Randy, we are back and uh, ready to go. David Jennings, RareBird101.com. A wild turkey... Super fan. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what, uh, David, what have you brought for second pour today? Okay, this is a single cast nation selection. Um, uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with the Jewish Whiskey Company, but they're basically an independent bottler, so they pick different barrels, or they would say casks, because a lot of times they're picking scotch. Um, and they bottle it in, independently uh, at full cast strength, non-chill filtered, uh, and uh, they've done a good many 
wild turkey releases at this point. They had two whiskey jubilees, which was a festival they used to have that they're no longer doing those for at the moment. Um, and then they've had probably, I think now they're on their, I believe their fifth, uh, the releases that are coming out, I believe it's their fifth under the single cast nation label with the wild turkey uh, distillery being the, the, the choice. So these are, these are really sought after. They're very sought after, yes. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have a friendship with, with Joshua and Jason. And um, it, it's, it's been an yeah, amazing past couple of years, uh, you know, talking with them and their passion for, for quality whiskey. Um, and, and in particular, wild turkey. Um, it's, uh, it's been really rewarding to have the opportunity to basically taste what comes straight out of the barrel, which, which mo- most folks don't get that. Right. Unless you go to Wild Turkey or you have maybe a pick locally. So when you go on a pick, you get to taste it that way. Of course, mm-hmm. when it delivers, normally it's right. not. And it's water, a little bit of water in there. Right, right. But this is uh, the unique thing about this particular uh, bottle. This was a, 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 a pick from Rickhouse K. Um, they had chosen a different barrel. And uh, Wild Turkey, somewhere along the lines, there was a mistake made, and they sent Joshua and Jason the wrong barrel. But instead of sending the barrel back, they kept it, and even though they weren't 100% happy with it at the time to put their name on it, they uh, sent it to their warehouse in Bardstown for some additional aging. So it aged well over 10 years, and about a year of it or more was in Bardstown. Um, When I tasted this for the first time, I was I was very impressed because I had just had their, their selections, their nine-year selections from from D and from K, and that uh, they had released a few months before this one. And I thought, well, nothing's going to top that uh, nine-year K because it, it was a it was a reject barrel, really, that they had found an asset if they could have because it was deemed as too off profile, and it was it was off profile, but it was amazing off profile. Yeah. So I thought nothing's going to beat that one. This one to me. Beats it. I mean, it just it has pretty much everything I'm looking for in a turkey barrel. Um, to be honest with you, um, a lot of layers, a lot of complexity. Look at that color. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it looks nice. So they they do a good job. They really do. Um, and uh, you know, you probably ought to look at having them on one day. Yeah, yeah good, good to talk to. They do a lot more scotch, but still, they they. They have a uh, well. We don't American have a problem with talking about leftover bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Whoops! Careful, uh, careful, uh, Randy. I know, that's true. Mm. Oh, that is delicious. That is really good. That is a flavor explosion. And that finish just goes on, yeah. and on and on on that one. It does, yeah. but it's not, man. It does, yeah. yeah and I think those legs are just going to stay on that glass. Yeah, it's it's around 120 proof or so. I don't have the bottle in front of mm-hmm. me, but it's up there. You can feel a little added heat to it. Yeah. I mean, a little bit more there than a than a typical Russell's. It's beautiful though. It just has yeah. a just a nice all around, just a nice all around profile. That's delicious. And maybe one day soon we'll have cast strength Russell's Reserve picks. That would be ideal. I think it's hard right now because, you know. When the program they have now is selling so well, I mean, a lot of folks can't even get their foot in the door on a pick now. Right. I don't really think there's any urgency on Campari to change anything, you know. So it's going to be tough. I know Eddie's pushing for it. I know it's something that he wants. You know, when it happens, I'm not sure, but I know it's been in talks for a while. Well, maybe you should use some of your uh, influence over. I've, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. I mean, uh, I've heard I've heard Bruce talk about you in your writings, and I know that Campari. Um, at least I've heard that Campari has an open ear when it comes to some of the things you're I, saying. That was a shock. I, I, I was I was real. Uh, I, I'd heard that. Yeah. You know, and uh, that came as a big surprise uh, that it meant that much uh, to them to even take the time to read means a lot to me to know that they do that. So um, so let me give you my list. One would be, you know, barrel proof picks. Another one would be, let's let's go back to the 107 entry proof. Mm-hmm. So if you can get those two things on your agenda, I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really think, you know, Bruce has said in the past, I was on another podcast, but he was talking about two things that he really wanted to do, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. One was, you know, keep things, you know, you can still have a run, you know, the way that they're doing things now. 
but there's no, you know, why not experiment and, and, and have a run where you make the barrel entry proof 107 and age those maybe somewhere special. And then, you know, 10 years down the road, maybe we have a special release or whatever. Or at least let's try. Let's, try let's, do, yeah. let's, let's do some experimentation Experiment. and, and do some tasting as it ages and see what the deal is. He's, he's pushing for that. Another thing that I, I like that he mentioned was having a another rye mash bill. Because Wild Turkey's rye, Jimmy, you know, he's not a rye fan. The only reason Jimmy had a, a rye whiskey is because Wild Turkey traditionally had rye. Now, Bruce is, right? Bruce is a huge rye fan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy was never a rye fan. He's just not. That's just not his thing. So from the beginning, he he was not really big in the rye. The rye was sourced for a long time. Rye came from either uh, Maryland, it's, uh, it came from Pennsylvania, or it came from Illinois. So until Austin Nichols purchased the actual distillery in 71, um, all the rye was coming from out of state. Um, as Jimmy got more involved with uh, the distillery under the ownership of Austin Nichols, um, he would he started distilling his own rye. But it's a barely legal rye. I mean, it's just over you know the, that fifty percent mark to to make a, a straight rye whiskey. Um, I think that Bruce is more interested in having a a rye. Higher rye rye. High, higher rye rye, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know what percentages he's looking at or thinking about, but I think that would be a neat thing too because, you know, we don't want to change, you know, fans, you know, don't really want the bourbon recipe changed. We don't really want that, you know, changed. But I'm all for experiment all you want to on the rye side because I, I, for, I could use a little bit more and rye. For, for our listeners who may not know, Wild Turkey literally has one mash bill, right? One mash bill for bourbon, one mash bill for rye. Right. Right. And uh, I, th- I don't think anybody really wants the bourbon, you know, recipe being changed. But, I mean, I don't see any problem. You could do, you could do two recipes of rye. You could keep the classic, you know, rye, and then you could maybe – have a new rye, you know, and call it something else. I don't know. Well, that seems to be the thing. There's a lot of distilleries out there doing some experimenting right now, yeah. especially with, you know, the big bourbon boom. I'm so all why for not? It. Why yeah. not? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me change directions here for a little bit. Let's 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 talk a little bit about your book. And uh, so what 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 prompted you to start writing a book? Especially about wild turkey specifically. Well, <laughs> For those that follow my blog, I think it kind of would make sense just because, you know, I'm always writing about wild turkey. When I write for my blog, my reviews tend to be more than reviews. It's kind of like reviews with with a little more insight or a little more depth or a story around them. Um, So writing about wild turkey is is not unusual for me. And I have my Patreon uh, site, which has a lot of additional content that I add there. And one day I was... uh, just, I don't know how really the conversation came up, but my wife suggested that I write a book. You know, she's like, you really ought to, you know, write a book about wild turkey. You're always writing about them. And, and I, I think you could do a good job with it. And I got to thinking about it. I'm like, it just sounded like such a chore. It was like, I just, you know, a book sounds heavy. You know, it sounds like, oh, that's a lot to do. Two pages a day, man. Two yeah. pages a day. That's all it is. Well, Stephen King does like six, you know. Oh, that's, so, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's... And uh, so I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> uh, but uh, I got to thinking about it. I'm like, you know, I tell you what. I told her I'd try. I'll sit down and I'll just try. And I sat down and I was just like, I'm just going to write the introduction. And it just started flowing. It just came out. And as I got into the first chapter where I get into the Rippy history, I was enjoying the research. I was really enjoying learning about the Rippies uh, and their history and legacy. And it wasn't really work. It was kind of like I just... It just was happening on its own. So I do a little by little by little, go back, fat check, you know, change if I need to, little by little. And before you know it, it was all coming together. And I had, I was like, wow, I've got, you know, 100 plus pages already done. I'm like, how, this is amazing, you know. And, uh, you know, half the book is history and half the book is appreciation. And so the appreciation side was easier in some ways because I was able to go back and pull notes um, from my journals and my blog posts to kind of you know, shape that. So there was a little bit of been able to regurgitate some information that I already had. Um, but it was also difficult because I'm trying to give 
you know, I can I can't just copy and paste a blog post. It's like I have to kind of make it for the book. So it's right. like you had to kind of massage it into something right, that right. flowed. And so that was difficult on that way. The history was difficult in making sure I had it right. All the and, c- citations were there. Yeah, that's where it came from. Well, you, yeah. And you have you might find one article that says something and then another article that says something else. And then I end up just having to you know message Eddie and I'm like, tell me what's the difference between this and this, you know. And uh, it it uh, it's finally come together where I sent a first draft to Fred Minnick and uh, and and uh, he was a big help help to me. Um, and I've sent some drafts to some other folks and gotten some really you know positive feedback. And uh, I'm almost done with my official second draft now. So okay. I've been working through a, and they a say edits. They say that once you get to writing your book, then you go back and then you do your introduction because it will change. <laughs> well, you know, it it was how I started telling my story because, like, I was like, "How do I write a book about wild turkey?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm going to write it from my perspective." So, you know, it was kind of like I wanted to say, you know, how did I get into this? You know? So it's kind of a journey. Like uh, your your book is no, kind of your journey through wild turkey. Or? It, it's not. Not really. I wanted to kind of paint a picture of how this book became came to be. Okay. And why I decided it was worth writing a book about in the first place. Got it. And to me, and, and the title of the book is Wild Turkey, American Spirit. And there's multiple, def, you know, meanings behind that. You have the release, the uh, expression Wild Turkey, American Spirit, which is a bottled and bond, the only bottled and bond Wild Turkey expression ever released. But then you have that. American spirit as in, you know, the spirit of America. And then you have American spirit as in, you know, alcohol. So it has a multi, you know, level thing. And so what I, I, when you, when you look at the history of wild Turkey, it all started with immigrants. Uh, There were French uh, Huguenot uh, immigrants that had moved to Ireland to escape religious persecution. They came to America, settled in what is now Anderson County, you know, Kentucky, um, and this is the Rippies. And uh, they started a long tradition of distilling that would lead into basically the exact same distillery that Jimmy Russell would, would, would be hired on to in time. Um, and there was, it's, so you go from that American frontier, you know, Jacksonian America to modern times. And there's a lot of stuff in between, you know, it's, it was, it's, it was, it was a lot of fun researching it. It really was. Wow. Uh, well, evidently, there's a lot of people waiting on this book, too, <laughs> because I understand the fundraising went very well for this. Yeah, it, that was a shock. Uh, I, I, I tossed and turned about what amount. Because, see, with Kickstarter, it's, it's all or nothing. If you, if you don't raise your goal, you don't get anything. And so I, I knew I needed at least enough to get something done. So my original idea was to print on uh, demand, where basically you... You do all the writing, the photography, the editing, get a graphic designer, put the book together, and you send it up to like Amazon. Amazon does that. Yeah, yes, and then I they know. can yeah. print on demand. Right. Okay. That was, and that's where I've left it right now. But I've got some talks going on. I can't get into too, too many details, but you know, this is looking to be a real deal book through a publisher. Wow. Um, cool. Hardback, you know, full color, you know, eighty pound paper, the, the whole deal. Um, and that is going to be. I feel like if if it's going to be done, I want it done right. And so, but yeah, the, the Kickstarter within just a few days, I, I put it out there, and it, I'd met my goal. Like I think in two or three days, and I was blown away by that. It was a, the generosity of of people and the interest that they have in the brand. It, it showed tenfold, you know. Right. Right. And, and and now it's at a level I never even imagined it would be. So, would be I mean, at. in the back of your mind, this is kind of what you always wanted, but you were being conservative. Being conservative and uh, realistic because, you know, I know it's a niche. You know, it's, uh, you know, bourbon's big right now. Mm-hmm. Bourbon books are big right now. But wild turkey is still very niche. And there's a reputation that comes along with wild turkey that's undeserved, but it's out there. I mean, you you pull anyone from the street and you start talking to them about wild turkey and they're going to think, you know, you're going to a frat party or something. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> so uh, uh, we're trying to overcome that. And I think it's happening, actually. I mean, you know, McConaughey has has given it a whole different look, you know, and made it more approachable for consumers that probably would have never given wild turkey the time of day. Um, and I think that uh, just with bourbon being so big, I think once people are exposed to Jimmy Russell, 
Eddie Russell, Bruce Russell, Joanne, when they get to know the Russell family or, or watch an interview or a podcast like you guys have, read articles, they realize that there's a lot more to this brand than a party whiskey. Right. And a lot more. Right. So, so when is this book going to be released? Okay. The, I've, I've put on the Kickstarter that I would like to have it done uh, by November, December for the holidays. So a great Christmas, Christmas great, gift but, there. But I would like to have a copy in Jimmy's hands by September 10th, which is his 65th anniversary at the distillery. Oh, which wow. yeah. No one in this world has ever done that, uh, you know, has been a, a distiller at the same distillery for that long. So have you, um, and, and I don't want you to give away anything you're not ready to give away, yeah. but have you... Uh, have you considered like having the book in the gift shop? Have you talked to maybe some personal interviews or do you have personal interviews? Well, uh, I am trying to work out something with the gift shop. I think the most important thing to me is I, I think about these things and I try to quiet them down in my head because I have to focus on having the best product. Campari is a very high class company. You can look at their ads. You can look at their products. They're, they're, very big on design. They're very big on a very sleek and presentable product. And if I'm going to have something that's going to be worth selling, you know, at a store that they own, it needs to be at that level. And, and so I think I just need to focus on that right, right. now. I need, to, I need to focus on the content. I've hired a, an excellent um, top of the line photographer, Victor Sizemore, uh, who is just has an amazing eye and a knack for taking uh, pictures that um, I think when it comes to bourbon, because he has a love of bourbon himself, he has a love for bourbon himself, it, it shows in his photography. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's going to add a lot to the end product. Uh, so, uh, again, my focus is just not so much thinking about the marketing. Let's just let's have a quality well, product. Has Campari had any input on layout and design kind of no, stuff? No, it's, it's my own thing. Um, they have given me permission to, to have whatever photos taken, you know, I need to take, they've, they've wow, worked with me. They've worked with me, uh, in a, very well. Um, the reason why I haven't, it's like, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's like, I could, I could approach Campari and say, Hey, let's work on this together. And then we're looking at a lot of paperwork, a lot of delays, a, a lot, lot of signatures, it's a corporate. lot of more people involved. Uh, it's okay. And it may either not happen or it may not happen the way I want it to. Right. So I figured it's, this is best done with my vision and with the help of others. And if I put something quality out there, then I just can cross my fingers and hope that they are, they'll want to be a part of it afterwards. But they've been they've been helpful. They've been very helpful and they have not roadblocked me one time. Not so, yet. so off the cuff. How do you keep yourself motivated? Because when you take on an undertaking like this, yeah. it, it, you can get bogged down. It's tough. Quick. I, I have a family, I have, you know, and, and it's, you know, I have an obligation as a husband and father to do things. And so I have to kind of keep all that check. And then I have a full time job. This is not my job. You well, know? What do you what do you do? I work for a bank. I work in insurance uh, for, for a bank. Oh, so okay. uh, I have to kind of keep all that in check. And so it, it uh, you know, it's one of these things when it comes to motivation, it. I have the motivation. I almost want to do more than I can. You know, I have to keep myself from overdoing it because a lot of times I'll stay up till one in the morning writing and then I'll look at the clock and be like, God, I'm really on a roll here. I don't want to have to go to bed, yep. but I, I got to get up at <laughs> six in the morning, you know? And so I have to say, it's like uh, I burn the midnight oil very frequently because I don't want to take time away from my kids. So, you know, I come home and you know, there's things that need to be done, homework and this type of thing. So I have to wait till they're in bed and then I work. And so sometimes that motivation, I actually have to kind of reserve it, you know, so. Yeah. So the book's a big undertaking. So uh, what's kind of next on your? Uh, well, I don't know if I can think of next yet. Yeah. I, I have to. Uh, You're still in the fight. I still have to think about the the uh, the book and I have to keep my blog um, it, it, going on a regular basis. Um, I have uh, a Patreon site that I've mentioned already, and I like to keep the content there fresh. 
Um, I've got a lot of barrel picks in the works. This this barrel pick that I'm doing tomorrow is one of several I've got planned, you know, for this year. So I've got a lot more of those. So you're doing up. barrel picks as a collaboration with certain retail outlets, and that's right. I'm doing a uh, a uh, collaboration with uh, Lexington Beverage Outlet in Lexington, South Carolina, um, and that's going to be the one for tomorrow. I'm doing another one uh, with them uh, in September. Now that'll be in Columbia with Eddie. Um, so that won't be here in Kentucky. And then I've got two special ones. I, I don't want to re reveal too much. I've got some special ones in the works that uh, are going to be with two pretty well-known individuals in the scene um, that I'm really looking forward to because they each have a genuine love for whiskey and wild turkey in their own unique way. So we, don't, we won't ask you the details of that, except when can we expect to hear more about those? Uh, very soon. At, at least the first one, I should have an answer uh, in the next week or so, uh, there's some things I'm having to work out as far as uh, logistics. So watch um, the blog. Watch the blog. Yeah, uh, you know, keep keep an eye on things uh, or Instagram. I, I, I let a lot of stuff out on Instagram. So, what do you think have been the keys to your success with your blog and this new book project? Oh boy. Well, I mean, there's a lot more successful blogs out there than mine. Um, I think with any with any blog regardless of what it's about. I think that you have to be passionate and honest. I think if you're passionate and honest and you can, you know, half right, you'll do, you'll do well. Because people, they like something that comes from the heart. They like something that, that is legitimate. Um, and they like something that's driven by a true appreciation. Um, so I think that having passion and, ha and being honest is going to do well in any in any blog. I, I would recommend anybody thinking about starting a blog, think about starting it because you really love what you're starting it for. Um, don't just say, I'm going to start a blog because I want to you know, have a whiskey blog. You know, it, it just comes on its own. When you're passionate about something, it just kind of happens anyway. You so know? be genuine. Be, be genuine. Be committed. Genuine and committed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote uh, from Stephen King that I love. It says... Uh, you know, talent is as cheap as table salt. Um, what makes the difference in someone that's talented and successful is the amount of hard work in between. Yeah, so, absolutely. Something like that. So. Very, very well spoken. Mm -hmm. Well, David, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time today to oh, sit down you. with us. We we appreciate it. It's great to have a, a couple of pours with you. Yeah, well, thank and you. And to hang out with your patrons here. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have to do this again sometime. Excellent. Yeah, I'd love after to. this book comes out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, hey. Trust me, I'd love to. I, I'm going to get the word out as, as yeah, much as I can. Put us on your book tour. There right. you go. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank uh, you. Cheers. Cheers. We'd really like to thank David for taking time out of his busy schedule here to meet with us at Base 110 Studio and record an episode. You can find David at rarebird101.com where you'll see his blog and a lot of information on wild turkey products. You can also reach out to David on Instagram at rarebird101, on Twitter at rbird101, and on patreon.com slash rarebird101. Now Randy and I are going to go join David and his Patreon supporters for a few fine, dusty pours. We do appreciate all of our listeners, and we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us here on the Bourbon Road. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and if so... We would appreciate if you'd subscribe and rate us a five-star with a review on iTunes. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Bourbon Road. That way you'll be kept in the loop on all The Bourbon Road happenings. You can also visit our website at thebourbonroad.com to read our blog, listen to the show, or reach out to us directly. We always welcome comments or suggestions. And if you have an idea for a particular guest or topic, be sure to let us know. And again, thanks for hanging out with us.